Um, and then I think we'll go ahead and get into introductions. Uh, my name is Tori Mara, and I am one of the co-founders of Outspoken Agency. And I'd like to thank you so much for joining us. If this is your first time, thanks for your first time in joining us to hear more about Paula and leadership. If you've been back before, um, thanks again for being a part of our Candid Conversation series. Uh, we are a speaking agency based in New York City. And obviously with the pandemic, we have not had much of a chance to do work with our speakers traveling to events like normal. So we thought this would be a good opportunity to engage speakers like Paula in some great conversations where we could discuss topics surrounding the pandemic, surrounding their expertise. So we are very excited to talk about leadership today. And a lot of this leadership conversation, we're going to be using the pandemic's leadership response as sort of a, a prime example of how we can um, un unwrap those leadership traits and learn to use those in our own lives. Um, so first, I'd love to tell you a little bit more about Paula and we'll get right down to it. Um, Dr. Paula Stone Williams is an internationally known speaker on gender equity, LGBTQ advocacy, and human understanding. As a transgender woman, Paula brings a unique perspective to her work on gender equity. She's spoken at TED Women with a talk that has millions of views online, and she's been featured on Red Table Talks on Facebook with Jada Pinkett Smith. Paula has lived much of her life in leadership roles, so we thought today's conversation would be a unique way to provide you with perspectives on living in those roles from both genders. So Paula, I would love you to first take a little bit of time to tell people more about yourself and maybe give us a little bit more insight into your leadership roles um, from both sides of the gender coin. Sure, I've always been a bit of a Renaissance person. I've never been someone who was content just to do one thing in my very first master's program. I had one of my main professors come to me and say, you know, you're one of the people that's just gonna have to do a lot of different things. And people are gonna tell you, don't do that, particularly at the time I was in that program in the 1980s. Said, you need to uh, give yourself permission to do a lot of different things. And so I did. And over the years, I've done a lot of different things. I was the host of a national television show that was on in the middle of the night. Its main purpose was uh, to try to provide comfort to people who were who couldn't sleep in the middle of the night uh, and put them back to sleep. And I was the number one host in doing so, which I think <laughs> is a compliment that I was really good at putting people back to sleep in the middle of the night. Uh, I also was the editor at large of a national magazine, a national religious magazine, a weekly magazine that had been published every week since 1866, whether it should have been or not. Uh, I was their editor at large for about 13 years. I was an adoption caseworker doing adoption, home study investigations, placement of uh, children from international countries uh, for adoption and post-placement supervision. I was a part of a, a company that operated homes for individuals with middle retardation. And, uh, and I was the CEO of a large nonprofit that started churches from scratch, which is a thing in the United States and has become quite a thing really since the 1970s. And there were probably seven or eight organizations nationally that became really, really good at it. And our organization was one of those. Uh, we existed in New York City. Originally, we worked only in the New York City metropolitan area. I was with them for 35 years. I was CEO for 25 years. And we grew from a budget of $100,000 a year to a budget of $4 million a year from just working in Long Island and New Jersey and the outer boroughs of New York City to working worldwide and uh, had a lot of success. We became one of the, the top within uh, the, uh, the world really in doing what we did, which is starting new churches from scratch and having them grow very, very rapidly. So we would start a new church with nobody and we would end up uh, averaging about uh, 500 by the end of year three and a thousand by the end of year eight or year 10. So we were in fact pretty successful at it. My second master's and part of my doctoral program were in identifying entrepreneurial leaders. And I was working in an evangelical denomination, a larger evangelical denomination, though I was kind of at the far left of that denomination, it was still evangelical, which means that the vast majority of those in leadership were males and mostly white males. If you take a look at the 100 largest churches in the United States, 99% of them have a male as senior pastor. Uh, that's only because the 100th doesn't have a senior pastor at the moment. 
and 93 of those churches have white males as their lead pastors. So my world was pretty much working with white male entrepreneurs who were quite good at what they did. We became very effective at identifying the right kind of people to lead a startup into rapid growth. And we were quite effective at it. We found that if you hired the right person and you adequately funded them, uh, you could have a church that reached the unchurched population and grew very, very rapidly. So that was my work and I became pretty successful in it at some point or another. I have spoken, preached in three of the 10 largest churches in the United States. So these are churches of um, over 20,000 people. Uh, I was comfortable and I was entitled and I had no idea at all. So when I came out as transgender, I knew that that world would reject me. I didn't know how quickly and how completely. So I probably knew, I'm gonna say five to 10,000 people by name. Since transitioning, I think I've heard from maybe 60 of them in a nice way. I think I have met one-on-one, -on -one. I think we're up to 23 or 24 uh, of those thousands of people. And more than once I've met six. So in other words, pretty much everybody from that world is gone. Now, interestingly, most all of those years I lived in New York, 35 years I lived in New York. And I had did a lot of work and had a lot of friends outside of the evangelical world. Interestingly, I lost none of those when I transitioned, not one. So you can kind of make of that as you will. Obviously, we have some issues when it comes to the LGBTQ population with evangelicals in America. But even though in that world, I lost none of my friends, most all of my friends in that world were very successful white males. So for me to move into a new world where I am a female and I am uh, trying to build a new career because I'd lost my career completely, it was a massive wake up call. And I thought in my previous life, the reason I rose to the top is because I was really good at what I did. And I've come to realize the reason I rose to the top is in fact, because of, I was very good at what I did, but also because I started way closer to the finish line than anybody else. That's what I think most white males just don't understand. That yes, you work really hard to get where you are. Yes, you have gotten a good education, in my case, two master's degrees and a doctoral degree. But when the day's done, you started way closer to the finish line than females or people of color. And that you just can't know until you know it. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for giving us that background. I know that you've uh, you've had a lot of struggles as a, a female leader recently, and we we've had conversations about those. But you know, in, in broader strokes, now we're we're dealing with a lot of of us being able to watch these leaders throughout the world, and um, and seeing how they're responding to this pandemic. So I'd love to get us to get into that first. Um, you know, what would you say are arguably these female attributes or traits that people sort of position as the feminine ones um, that have had these successful leaders show that then might have best served their countries during this pandemic? You know, it's been fascinating to watch. I've been uh, doing a lot of work with TED over the last uh, few years. After speaking for TED Women, I was invited to the TED Summit in Edinburgh last summer. And then I'm currently working as a speaker's ambassador for a TED, which was supposed to take place in Vancouver, but now is all online. And last Wednesday, they had uh, Kristalina Georgieva, who is the head of the uh, International Monetary Fund, uh, a mother from um, uh, Bulgaria, uh, have, had her talking about what's being done right now in developing nations in the midst of the pandemic to try to bring things around. And she noted seven distinct differences in female heads of state. And of course we know that female heads of state 
have done well during the pandemic, far better than male heads of state. Probably the most obvious has been Angela Merkel, Merkel from uh, Germany, but also uh, the prime ministers of Finland, Norway, uh, Iceland, New Zealand, uh, and um, Taiwan, all females, and all have done a better job. And so Chris Anderson, who's the head of TED, was asking, um, this is uh, uh, Georgieva, why? Why are these countries doing better? And she was very quick to give her answers. Um, she said, women are better at showing empathy than men, which is clearly so. She said they are more decisive than men. And that brought some interesting questions because that's not necessarily something I have observed. But she said, um, when I was a mother getting up at 4 a.m. waiting in line in the Soviet Union in Bulgaria to get milk for my daughter, you have to make decisions quickly. All mothers have to make decisions quickly about what we're doing for dinner, when the roast burns, about what to do when the child gets sick in the middle of the night. We are in fact more decisive than men, faster than men. And you know, I thought about it. I can't deny that. Now that I work primarily with females, I find that I'm still, you know, I'm, I live in between genders. I'll always live in this, this uh, the borderlands or the liminal space between male and female. In that uh, I, I do have that unique perspective of having seen life from both sides, but I also function in both ways. And I find most of the women I work with um, will consider, will all consider the various possibilities, but they're faster to be ready to make a decision than I am which I thought was interesting that she said that. She said, and this one, this is what she said, okay? She said, <laughs> women are not inclined to moan and complain like men. And that we can see this in the midst of the pandemic. So I'm just gonna let that go by itself. <laughs> okay. She says that women, that women are far better at embracing nuance than men are. And I do find that to be true as well. Um, they are, uh, women fire more neurons between hemispheres. Men's neurons tend to fire within hemispheres. So if you take a look at a male brain firing under uh, fMRI, you'll see that most everything is happening within the hemispheres. And occasionally, you know, you see things crossing over left to right hemisphere of the brain, but it's hard to do. It's kind of like trying to go cross town in Manhattan uh, in Midtown during rush hour. It just doesn't happen very well. Women's brains, on the other hand, are constantly having these neurons firing from left brain to right brain. So a woman's creative brain and um, logical brain are functioning more holistically than a male. And so men tend to think either left brain uh, logically or right brain creatively tend not to do it at the same time. Women tend to be doing it more holistically, which allows them to embrace nuance more quickly. She also noticed that women compromise more easily than men because they work collaboratively better than men do. So they're more accustomed to working in a compromised situation. Plus, they don't have testosterone telling them that they need to be at the top of the pack, uh, which is something that all males have to deal with. The sixth she gives is that women are being more open, are more open to being corrected when they're wrong. So if they had done a wrong pathway, they see pretty quickly that they're on the wrong pathway and will make a turn where men aren't willing to do that. She also says, uh, that women tend to be more resilient than men, uh, that the average woman is working at least eight hours more a week than a male, and uh, that's at work. And then also she's carrying another full-time job at home most of the time. Men think that they're doing as much as uh, women at home. Uh, the truth is there's not a study on earth that shows that they actually are doing as much as women at home. They just think they are. I mean, I see that so clearly now. It's a wonder that my former wife even speaks to me. <laughs> we work together as psychotherapists. Um, but I think so many times I go to her and say, I'm so sorry. And she just rolls her eyes and I think, <laughs> she's just going to do me in. It's, it's, she's, she's very gracious because I just didn't know what I didn't know. We're also a forgiving gender, I would say. So, so much more so than males. So although there is this thing that happens with females that I also have discovered, in most ways, I much prefer working with females than with males. But um, there is this competitive thing that happens with females that is quite different 
from males. Uh, it's um, my best friend just says it's a it's a cattiness that is in fact real with females. Mm-hmm. They tend to be pretty competitive with each other in ways that I did not see quite as much uh, with males. Yeah. So, I mean, a lot of this, what you're saying, I guess we could argue that it's a little bit of nature versus nurture, a little bit of physiological versus cultural. Um, And certainly we don't want this to be an all male bashing conversation. There's a lot of positives that males can bring to the table with leadership. And so I'm wondering if you've had um, with your research and, and, learning and reading from other people talking about these leadership roles involved in the pandemic have we seen any positive responses from males and is that difference based on culture where what countries they're coming from how they're responding to this crisis yeah actually you do and what you see are males who are leaders and all of these people are leaders all of these people are agentic leaders or what we might call alpha uh, leaders but the males who are capable, who have a stronger ego structure, a uh, uh, greater ego strength, less ego need, that those males tend to be very strong and capable leaders. Like you take the, uh, the Irish prime minister, for instance, who, who's a physician on the 17th, on, on uh, 17th of March, so on St. Patrick's Day, he gave a speech that was very human, very personable, and went back to practicing medicine one day a week, telemedicine primarily, but has been able to rally his country in ways that, um, you know, just across the channel hasn't happened. And that's out of humility. Henry Nouwen always said that if you take a look at the greatest leaders in history, uh, and at this point he was talking primarily about male leaders, said you, you always see two paradoxical strengths. You see great confidence coupled with great humility. And when you take a look at that, you see that. You see that in a number of our presidents. You think about uh, the difference between the first Gulf War and the second Gulf War. Bush 41 brought 20 other nations with him into the first Gulf War, which ended up being a very short war, uh, quickly won. His son uh, brought two nations with him into the Gulf War. And it's the difference between the way the two operated. One operated from a place of gentle strength, great confidence coupled with great humility. He would call these other world leaders, what do you think? Uh, I need you, I can't do this without you. And his son came in with what we would more typically see as the, the kind of male leader, we used to hire them for new churches and they could grow a church rapidly, but then they never were able to give up their power either. Um, His son just went barreling in, possibly under the influence of the Secretary of Defense and of the Vice President that he had at the time, who actually were even stronger and more strident than he. But you see this massive difference between Bush 41 and Bush 43. And that, I think, is, is the difference we see between the male leaders who are very effective right now in the midst of the pandemic and those that are not. Of the Prime Minister of... Um, Korea, for instance, is a man of quiet competence and not a lot of charisma. Well, that's also a part of their culture. Charisma is not as important in that culture as the quiet competence. And so his ability to do things very quickly is much appreciated. And you take a look at the the countries that are dealing with it the worst uh, are arguably, from my perspective, and this is my opinion, uh, would be three world leaders that have great ego need and not much ego strength. And that would be the the leaders of um, Great Britain. Uh, Not, interestingly, Scotland at all. Um, But Great Britain, so England, let's be more specific about that, and uh, the United States and Brazil. Those would be probably the, the three where you have the biggest example of someone who has great ego need and not a whole lot of ego strength. And so for them to admit that they might be headed down the wrong path, Uh, is extremely difficult for them to do. They tend not to be as collaborative. They don't compromise as much. They don't see nuance. They don't show empathy. And it ends up very negatively impacting um, their nation, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. So what do we do? um, Go ahead. Just just one other example when I think about that. Mm -hmm. 
I, I certainly don't want to bash men and I don't necessarily, it's not my purpose to bash the current leadership in the United States. But I just was thinking yesterday about the fact that we passed that mark of 100,000 deaths without a single comment uh, from the President of the United States. And I think about, I'm old enough to remember well, I had gone to the nursery, nursery school to pick up my, my youngest child uh, who, uh, who turns 40 this year and, um, and heard of the Challenger disaster. And it was so disturbing to me, but that very night, Peggy Noonan, one of the best presidential speech writers ever had written the speech for Ronald Reagan. But I still remember to this day, and I thought of it yesterday, they've slipped the surly bonds of earth to touch the face of God. That was a line she wrote for him that he delivered with great empathy that brought together the grief of an entire nation into just one phrase that so many of us remember. That was 1986, so all these years later. And it's, it's so tragic now that no one is able to speak that collective voice for us. We know that consistently, people in a crisis, 10% of the people immediately know what to do in a crisis and will start doing it. 10% of people will go the opposite way, will make terrible decisions during a crisis. The other 80% are waiting for someone to tell them what to do. And mm. particularly in a situation like this, to tell them how to feel. And this is where female leaders have an edge because they're not afraid to say how they feel in a situation like this, to show some emotion. Even the prime minister of, um, of Norway started holding press conferences specifically for children. I have that. a hard time imagining that happening in very many nations that are led by a male. Yeah, that's, that's such an incredible um, an interesting way to engage your full constituency, <laughs> even though we don't think as children as really our political constituents yet, but they're kind of building our future. So it's so important. Um, so, you know, in talking about what women like that are doing, how do we increase the female representation and leadership roles in government and uh, elsewhere in organizations? Um, how do we get that done? Yeah, if I had the answer to that, um, I'd be in a great place. You know, women are earning still today 79 cents on the dollar in the United States of what men are earning. That's white women. Uh, African American women are earning 64 cents on the dollar. Native American women, 59 cents on the dollar. Um, uh, Hispanic American women, 54 cents on the dollar. We're 100 years away from pay equity, let alone any other kind of equity. We have a long way to go. And I, I sometimes, you know, I find that there are times that I, I am more inclined to, I think in almost uh, isolation kinds of ways that aren't particularly helpful. I was in a conversation just the other day after George Floyd's death uh, with a number of people. And one of them was an African, African American woman, a very sweet, wonderful woman I greatly respect, who said, you know, I'm kind of sorry that we ever had integration. Uh, at this point, I just would really rather live my life just among other Blacks. And it was a very, very tender and vulnerable moment. And the rest of us were speechless because I really couldn't argue with her. Well, I say that because last summer I spoke at a Forbes magazine event with about, uh, how many, were, there were maybe 150, you were there, Tori. Yeah, uh, probably 100 to 150. Mm -hmm. Yeah, female founder CEOs. And talking with those women, listening to those women, there was a part of me that was like, it, it's going to take entrepreneurially oriented women who are willing to say, let's do this as women and plant new trees for a new forest. That I know is not ultimately workable, but I find that the obstacles that men put before women are so great that it's going to be a long time before we get past them. The differences in how I'm treated as a female and how I was treated as a male 
are massive. And I, I certainly have a far harder time proving my leadership now than I did before. Yeah, it's so hard for us. I mean, obviously there's a lot going on the news um, and we're not really going to get into racial equity in leadership. Um, there are some questions that we'll touch on loosely, but um, it's hard to think about how you can understand someone else's perspective unless you live it and you have uniquely lived both sides of this gender issue, um, which is why we're so thankful to have you talking about it. But, you know, is there, um, in thinking about this, are there ways that we as women need to be held accountable um, for supporting other women in the workplace or in other leadership roles to increase representation, if at all? Yeah, I think there are. I think it's it's important to talk about them within the context of knowing what uh, the obstacles they're up against, uh, knowing the things that um, that our patriarchal society makes extremely difficult for women. Because I think a lot of what women need to do is based on the reality of the of the circumstances they're in. For instance, women are just not invited into the meeting. So many decisions are made on the golf course or in the tennis court uh, or in the after hours uh, cocktail party when women have gone home to take care of their families. Um, there's not a whole lot women can do about that. Uh, the fact that men are constantly interrupting women um, and don't even invite women into the meeting, the fact that they don't give women credit for their ideas, that mothers with children at home are hired 44% uh, less often than a, uh, another person uh, for that same job. But what can women do um, in, in light of those realities? First, I think women need to empower other women. Men do empower one another. One of the things I would notice as a male is that as soon as you went into a room, and I think some of this is actually just, just pure um, evolutionary built into the species from testosterone, the first thing you do is determine who the alpha is in the room. And then once you've determined who the alpha is, you rank yourself according to the alpha. And then once that's done, you get about accomplishing the purposes of the alpha. Or to put, a, put it in a sports analogy, you, you get in a huddle, you smack each other on the butt, and then you advance the quarterback and the ball down the field. Um, men do this. They empower one another based on who they see as the alpha until it's time to challenge the alpha. The alpha is not challenged. When it's time, then of course the alpha is in trouble. So I have always taken that for granted that men uh, do work together to accomplish, his, accomplish the purposes of the, of the person who's in charge. And I find that women don't, that they tend to look at power as a zero sum game that um, often if you're talking to somebody in a C-suite, it's like, damn it, I had to work hard to get here. And so I'm not going to empower you in this. You're going to have to work hard to get here too. But then it also may be that it's really true because you just don't have as many females in those C-suite positions. If you take a look at the Fortune 500 companies, only 22% of senior vice president roles are held by females. 5.8% uh, of CEOs are female. Silicon Valley, 6.6% of CEOs are females. Uh, so, I mean, it's, it's a truth, but it's a truth that's, that's based on a perspective of scarcity. Um, what I see is that alpha females who have a high EQ, emotional quotient, um, uh, relational intelligence, uh, they tend to be really good at empowering other women. Uh, it's alpha females with a lower EQ that don't uh, empower other women. So I, I think that's the first thing that women can do is uh, recognize the importance of empowering one another instead of working from a perspective of scarcity. Mm. I, I just want to remind everyone, um, well, I haven't told you yet, but there is a Q&A box. Um, we will be taking questions from Paula. Some of you did pre-submit questions, so we're going to try to get through as many of those as possible. Uh, but if you are thinking of any questions you'd like us to ask Paula, you can submit those in the Q&A box, and we'll try to get to as many as we can. Um, I do have a pre-submitted question that's kind of along the lines of what we're talking about, so I'd love to bring that up. 
Um, Julie asks, what can I do in meetings? She's a female. Um, when my male coworkers keep talking over my female coworkers, but not me. Yeah, I think that's where it's really important. Uh, I say this to men all the time. Don't interrupt women. Men interrupt women twice as often as they interrupt other men. But women also interrupt women twice as often as they interrupt men. So I always say to guys, um, don't interrupt. Well, first of all, make sure women are in the room. Once they are, don't interrupt them and stop those who do. And that's easier for the guys to do than it is for the females to do. But I think it's pretty important uh, for the females. It's, you can't do that for yourself very well or you're gonna be called a bitch. Uh, I've discovered that pretty quickly. I'm always on this knife edge now. If I speak up for myself, well, I'm a bitch. If I don't speak up, well, now I'm not really a leader. And so you're constantly having to read the tea leaves and say, you know, I mean, can I speak up for myself? Can I not? Easier for another woman to say, excuse me, I don't believe she was done yet. Most of the time, when that's done, when you'll interrupt the interrupter and say, excuse me, I don't think she was quite done yet you will find it only takes one or two of those instances before the guys will stop interrupting. One of the problems here is that men are taught to be confident. Women are taught to be perfect. And so you go right through your education system, right through the end of college, and you pretty much are doing fine, females are, because trying to be perfect, you end up getting a 4.0, you end up scoring well. But then you get out into the real world and that need to be perfect is now working against you. I understand mothers particularly wanting to teach their daughters, it's gonna be hard for you when you get out of the real world. You're gonna to have to work twice as hard as all the guys. You can't just be good, you gotta be perfect. But you get into that business meeting and it works against a female because guys, because they've been taught to be confident, are taught to think out loud. Uh, you know, yeah, yeah, I got it. I mean, you know, you, you have a new position that opens up at the company and it has five requirements and a guy has two of those requirements and he thinks, I got this, I'm applying for the job. A woman has four and she thinks, oh, but I don't have the fifth. And so she doesn't apply for the job. And yet she was far more qualified it's because we taught our daughters to be perfect and we've taught our sons to be confident. So guys will think out loud and they have no problem talking in a meeting. Women, because they've been taught to be perfect, think they can't speak up until they have their ducks in a row, until they know exactly what they want to say and can say it succinctly because they're going to be interrupted. Mm -hmm. And they will wait far longer. And so they don't speak up as often. And the best idea is left inside their minds and not out in open in the meeting. So much of that I've discovered is, uh, for me, you know, I mean, I was, I had decades of being told, it's fine for me to speak up, fine for me to think out loud, but it did not take me long living as a female to keep my ideas to myself because of the interruption issue. I love it so much when another woman in the room is willing to say, excuse me, I don't think Paula was done yet. And I always thank you very much and then jump right back in. But I think that's probably the, the best thing you can do in, those, in that situation. Yeah, continue that allyship. You know, what um, you talk about these different female attributes from the conversation you watch with Ted and then these male attributes in meetings with the confidence versus perfection for women. What ways can an organization try to train their male managers to adapt to these typically labeled female attributes or vice versa for the women to gain that confidence and those other masculine attributes that will help them excel in those leadership roles? I think the first thing men need to do is be made aware of just the facts that, that women are not invited to the meeting, that they do interrupt women. I think that they need to understand that women often don't get credit for their ideas. Uh, women are less likely to have their ideas correctly attributed to them, far, far less likely. Uh, women are more collaborative, more profitable, more inclusive, uh, more effective leaders, less likely to take unnecessary risks, uh, great at multitasking, have a higher EQ than men. Men just need to understand that those are realities and that they need to be respected realities. 
I don't think we'll get there until companies are willing to hire and promote mothers uh, because mothers do tend to be far more efficient, far more effective, better risk takers. Men need to be aware of, the, of their implicit bias. It, it is a woman who stays, who does, a man who stays late for work is evaluated 14% more favorably than a woman who stays late for work. But if neither one of them stays late, the woman is docked for it, given a 12% lower rating while a man isn't. Women's mistakes are noticed more and remembered longer, especially if they're women of color. They're twice as likely to feel burnout as men. Overworking affects women's health more than men. Women and men of color have to have eight additional years of experience to get the same number of callbacks as somebody with an identical resume but a white sounding name. So, I mean, we've got some real problems that guys need to be aware of. And I think the first piece with the men is just education. Because here's the thing, most guys want to get it right. The vast majority of men want to get it right. What they don't realize is their entire lives, when they go to work, they give up nothing of themselves. When they go into a meeting, they give up nothing of themselves if they're a white male, because that meeting was designed for white males. They've never had to adapt to a different setting that is not focused on them and their needs. They never have to leave a part of themselves at the door. And women and people of minorities have to do that all the time. So I have another audience question that was pre-submitted that I think would be good to follow up on. Um, Shay asks, do these leadership styles and skills translate the same for women of color? And can they build it's those in the same way with these it's masculine? It's interesting. I did both of my, um, both my second master's degree and my doctoral uh, project were utilizing the DISC test, which is, I think, one of the most effective uh, tools, uh, testing tools out there for work preference styles. And we find that in terms of work preference styles and skill sets, there's actually very little difference between genders and very little difference between ethnicities. It's, it's fascinating that that basic personality, in other words, tends to be pretty hardwired into us. And so if you have, the disc shows a dominance influencing steadiness or conscientiousness, most people have a dyad, two things that are strong. So if you're dominant and influencing, which means you are, uh, that would be um, Ronald Reagan or Bill Clinton uh, or uh, any kind of charismatic leader who also is a strong leader, that females will in fact be every bit as effective in that area as males and um, people of color will not have those skills any greater or any lesser degree that these tend to be kind of hardwired into the species if you will regardless of setting the difference is in the surroundings that we are in how is that received and so much of, we think that we're this rational species that makes decisions based on uh, the facts. And the truth is we're not, we're an intuitive species. And we don't change our minds about anything unless the information comes to us in a non-threatening way. And so when you get predispositions that have been established in the culture that are, um, that are, baked into that culture, patriarchal culture, for instance, you're gonna have issues. For instance, I speak at a lot of companies on the East Coast and the West Coast, where you don't have much, um, much awareness that in 28 states of the United States, the major religious teaching is that men are supposed to be in charge of women at home, at work, at church and in virtually every area of society. This is the major teaching. And it's a teaching that is primarily white male in its, uh, its genesis. As long as we still have that kind of teaching 
that is so impacting over half of the states of the United States. We're going to have these kinds of implicit biases against females and against people of color, even against introverts, because people have been taught from the beginning the information that they have been given is that uh, it is white males that are supposed to be in charge of everything. So I think it's actually much easier for a white female uh, to be in a leadership position uh, than it is for a female of color to be in a leadership position. Uh, white females still carry a lot of privilege. My own daughter, my middle daughter, is a person of color and my, uh, my daughter-in-law is a person of color. And both of them have said to me post-transition, they say, okay, well, now you understand half of our experience. Mm -hmm. And my, my own daughter is actually an administrator in the Denver Public Schools, you know, raised in New York, uh, raised in a white family. I mean, we didn't know what we were doing. We, we yeah, end up raising this uh, very, very dark-skinned, um, uh, daughter from India who, and then we give her a Hebrew name. <laughs> it, you know, she came, she was like 14 and she came into the bedroom one night and she said, I just want to get this straight. I'm a brown child in a white culture. I'm an Indian child in an American culture. Uh, and yet you give me a Hebrew name, J-L, J-A-E-L, a uh, Hebrew name of a babe who drove a spike through a sleeping king's head. Do I have this right? <laughs> We're like, oh, Jaya, we're so sorry. We were just stupid. We just didn't know. But because of that, you know, raised in that world, she came out fighting strong. Well, in Colorado, 3% of the population is African-American. And her husband's African-American. And um, she's generally seen as African-American. She looks uh, uh, not as Indian. And she's just had to develop a really, really tough skin. I feel for her. I think, I think she's probably right. If I've had, uh, if I've had to come down fifty percent, in terms of just walking in and expecting to be in a position of power, uh, maybe it's another fifty percent from there to what she experiences. Yeah. Well. Um... I'm wondering, let's see, we skipped a, a, around a little bit in our questions, but a lot of us are going to be working home for uh, the foreseeable future. I know some organizations have made announcements. Some of us are trying to figure out what our new normal will be, whether that's over the next few months, the next year. Um, but in this new temporary or uh, life that we're living in, um, working from home, Will that start to change dynamics in positive ways for how we work with our leaders? And also, will it improve leadership opportunities for women? I don't know if you even want to touch on maybe opportunities for people of color who would have otherwise been excluded because of household responsibilities, like you said, with the women having to go home earlier and be docked for that time away from their job. Now we're living in a new work lifestyle. How will that change and maybe help us? Yeah, I think that um, there are a few things women can do in that circumstance. And no, I don't feel comfortable. I just don't know enough about the experience of, of people of color. I'm, I'm really in, in so many ways when it comes to understanding the experience of, of females of color, I feel like I'm still a, 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 an incredibly privileged white guy. Um, and so I, I don't think I, I really have a lot I can say in that. I do think there's some things that women need to understand in this particular time frame. Women need to say no to carrying the emotions for men or triangulating for men. Men typically are not as capable as women at understanding what they're feeling. Uh, I know that my own ex-wife uh, had to say to me, I don't know, maybe a year into my transition, one day she actually said, I can't, uh, I can't, tell you what your feelings are anymore. You're going to have to figure it out, figure them out for yourself. Because it would be typical for me to come home and tell her everything that had happened uh, at work, whatever, and then look, look for her emotional response to know what my emotions were supposed to be. 
because men often cannot identify their emotions. And so they count on the women to identify emotions for them. Sometimes this is true as a psychotherapist too. There are times that you see particularly men in psychotherapy will tell you something that happened to them as a child when they were abused. And they're, they look to you and it's actually helpful if you can say, wait, 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 you, what happened to you? And that finally gives them then permission to see that what happened to them was not acceptable. Men will often be looking to women to say, what emotion should I be feeling? And so you see this particularly in the pandemic. And women need to say, you need to figure that out yourself. Uh, you, I can't carry your feelings for you. I can't triangulate for you. Women will tend to triangulate for men that men will, I don't understand how she works. Can you talk to her for me? Yeah, no. Need to say no to that. I think another thing that women need to do in these times, because there's so, there's so much going on uh, and so many needs within a company that, are, that need to be met, women are not taught to say, yes, I can do that. I think if you think you understand 20% about what it takes to get something done, and someone is saying, I, we need somebody who can, who can step up and say, yes, I can do that. I, women need to say, yeah, yeah, I can do that. And be confident, you can figure out the other 80% because by golly, you can figure out the other 80%. That you, I think this is an opportunity for women to say, yes, I can do that and own that leadership opportunity. And then another thing, I think women need to stop apologizing uh, I find that women spend a lot of their time apologizing. I'm sorry. Like I said in my first TED talk, you don't have to apologize for being right. Yeah. I, I think it's really, you know, this is an opportunity to say, um, I know what the problem is. I can solve this problem. I can do that with, without apology. I think this is a time that it might be easier to ask um, forgiveness than it is to ask permission. Yeah. We have a question from Matthew. It's going to go back a little bit to the beginning of our conversation. And he asks, during COVID, what do you make of the terrible leadership coming from female governors of Iowa, South Dakota, or Alabama? Um, well, you know, ag again, you will always see that these aren't particularly gendered things. I think you'll see more often uh, that women will work more collaboratively, more often that they will um, be, uh, be more decisive more quickly, that they will recognize when they've had a down or wrong path more quickly. But no, not always, not always. Um, yeah, I'll just let it go with that. Yeah. You know, anytime you're talking about generalities, there are always going to be exceptions. Are they the exceptions that prove the rule, or are they, um, or are are there really no differences between how the genders lead? I believe there are significant differences in how the genders lead, but it, it you know genders on a spectrum, and so all of us have our strengths and our weaknesses and how we lead. Mm, yeah. We have another question from Tobias. Um, this is more of a question directed to you, not um, specifically leadership, but did you have an aha moment that uh, this is what it means to be seen as and live as a woman moment? What was it and how did it shape you? I think probably the, the first huge one was I had been asked to serve on a board of a large uh, national nonprofit. And we had hired a new female CEO and we ran a conference. And so the board was saying, well, should we have her do a keynote speech for the conference? And I, um, I spoke up and said, well, um, you know, she's not a public speaker. It's not really something that she's done. Um, it probably would be better if we interviewed her, I think, and I'd be happy to, to do the interviewing. But if you want her to speak, um, I'll be happy to coach her. At which point, a uh, powerful white male in the room, um, actually McKenzie partner, said, I wonder if we're going to do that. Why don't we get a real coach? 
And I was dumbfounded, completely dumbfounded. I, what I wanted to say was, oh, wait, excuse me. Um, I've done four TED Talks. I've coached TED speakers. I've taught speech at three universities, two seminaries in the United States and Europe. I've spoken to crowds of thousands. I guess what part of that does not make me a real coach? Mm -hmm. And I realized in that organization, this I find true all the time as a female. If I'm in a meeting as a female, it's assumed I'm competent at one thing. And I said at the beginning that I've always been a bit of a Renaissance person. I have a lot of areas that I've worked in, but it's assumed that, well, you, you're competent at one thing. In that setting, the assumption was that I was competent in American religion because I used to teach a doctoral course, Current Trends in American Religion. So as far as that man was concerned, I was on the board because I knew something about American religion. So surely I couldn't be a competent coach or public speaker. That was the aha moment. And the fact that no women spoke up for me, there were plenty of women in the room who knew good and well what my credentials were. No one backed me up. I was on my own and I just shut up. And pretty much that was the beginning of shutting up in meetings like that. Hmm. Well, we are close to out of time, but I do have one more question for you. Something maybe you can leave us with. If anyone else has any questions, we can try to get one more in from the audience. Um, thank you to those who have submitted. But is there, what is, you know, maybe the best leadership lesson we can all take away from this crisis to help us better navigate work culture, whether we're in roles in positions of power or we are those serving others not in positions of power? How do we, maybe if we are leaders, how do we serve those not in power? And if we are not in power, how do we serve those in, in leadership roles to better collaborate? This is going to seem like an odd answer to that, but I think possibly the most important thing we can do right now is to give one another permission to grieve. What I'm finding in too many corporate settings is there is such, it's almost like the stock market, there is such a desire to look beyond the end of this time and not to acknowledge that these are unprecedented times and we're all frightened. And I think that a willingness to acknowledge the elephant in the room that we're frightened, we don't know what the future holds, that neither we nor our parents nor our grandparents have been through anything like this. No one living has been through anything like this, more than a handful of people. I actually think helping one another grieve and express our emotion in the midst of this is probably the one single most important thing that can be done. And I think women are gonna have an easier time doing that, but I think men willing to do it or capable of doing it, like the Irish prime minister, um, or, um, or a number of our own governors. I think that's why so many people were tuned in to this tough and hard New York politician in uh, Andrew Cuomo and willing to listen because he was in fact even in his emotion expressing our collective grief. Mm, yes, I've been a an avid follower of, of Andrew Cuomo's <laughs> daily daily briefings. Yeah. And there's been a lot of information that's been tough to swallow, but um, yeah. helpful to have that person with some compassion talking to us every day. Yeah. Yeah, the ability to show empathy and uh I, like I said, I do believe, in fact, the greatest leaders, whether male or female, are people who have those paradoxical strengths of great confidence coupled with great humility. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Paula, this has been a wonderful conversation. I'm sorry we don't have more time to take more questions and talk about things. I know uh, based on all of our conversations in the past, I could pick your brain for hours. So thank you for taking a little bit out of your day to talk to all of us about leadership. 
And I want to thank you, Tori and Tara and Katie. Uh, you, you guys have, um, you guys have been amazing uh, to work with you. You know, it's, um, I mean, I specifically chose a female founded agency with all three of you and um, I, I just, I appreciate so much working with you guys. You, you guys are amazing. Well, thank you. Yeah, it's been a wonderful experience so far. And we're so grateful to have people like you on our roster and able to connect you with wonderful clients and colleagues and friends throughout the world. And we're hoping that this is something that we'll be able to continue to do, whether on the screen or in person for many, many years to come. But um, we're going to continue to do a little bit of this in the meantime. So thank you for doing this today. Thanks for having me. Of course. So thank you everyone for attending. Um, we are going to be sending you out an email with a recap of what we spoke about today. Some, maybe some resources to Paula. Um, and we'll also send you a link to the video recording. That way you can watch again, share with others, and uh, hopefully take away some, some helpful tips for the future with how you'll guide yourself and others in, in leadership roles. So thank you so much for joining us today. We'll be back again next week. I believe we're back at noon. We've kind of been uh, flopping between 1 p.m. and 12 p.m. Eastern. So we'll be back. That'll all, all that information will be on the email. So we hope you can join us for another one. And uh, thanks again for the support today. We'll see you soon. Bye, Paula.